Well, it's uh, great to be with you uh, tonight. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, let me just begin by saying how uh, delighted we are on behalf of all of my colleagues at Gordon to host this uh, terrific meeting. Uh, we're very excited to have all of you here. Gordon is a great place. And uh, you know, this is pretty much how the weather is year round uh, here. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because uh, I have been here for just about a year. And everyone told me to prepare for these nor'easters and these blizzards. And do you know the most exciting weather story we had all year was a hurricane. Now, I moved from Houston, and I can handle hurricanes. So uh, I, I've appreciated the Lord's making it an easy entry into New England for my family and I. But we are especially pleased uh, to have uh, this gathering here. We care very deeply about the life of the mind. And one of the great gifts that institutions can provide for the wider academy is to convene groups of folks who are here who uh, share common intellectual interest, methodological diversity, and a hope that our scholarship and our, uh, our work and, and really our lives might count for more than just we are, what we are paid to do on a weekly or monthly basis, but we actually want to contribute to the flourishing of this world, to the advancement of our um, knowledge and understanding, and to help produce the next generation of uh, young people who are wiser and better. And they get that way because of the good work that you are doing. I also realize that probably most of you could be compensated much better at other institutions, uh, but you very much view the work that you're doing as a calling. And so you have not just my appreciation, but also my respect. So I'm glad to be here tonight. It's a special uh, evening. I'm glad that the Robertson School is sponsoring the reception. I will enjoy that. I had one of my very first interviews was actually with Pat Robertson on the campus of Regent. So uh, tonight I want to share with you some of the different things that uh, I've been working on. Um, as a college president, you actually don't have a whole lot of time to, to devote to your scholarly work. That's actually been one of the most jarring experiences over the last year. Uh, I've worked for two years on a, an article to get into one of the major sociology journals and uh, have three co-authors on the paper. We submitted it to um, the, the top journal, American Sociological Review, and it was rejected but got some very helpful feedback. We submitted it to Administrative Sciences Quarterly. Um, it was um, rejected there, but we got more feedback. <laughs> and then we submitted it to uh, Social Problems, which is a, a, a very strong journal in, in our particular field. And uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that you, you work really hard because it's an important outlet and it gives you an opportunity to sort of demonstrate your knowledge. And we got a very nice revise and resubmit about six months ago, one that we should easily be able to achieve. The challenge is that I'm the first author. And uh, it's going to take about 25 hours to make the adjustments. I know what needs to be done. It's just a matter of getting the time to do it. And a year ago, I would have cleared everything to do it, but it's kind of hard to clear everything now. So we, we're facing a deadline of July 8th is when we have to get it back in. I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed. So tonight is a nice occasion because it gives me a chance to put back a little bit of a hat that I've been wearing for several years and to share with you some of the different things that I've been learning over the course of completing a, a large research project. My first book, Faith in the Halls of Power, outlined a, a segment of it, but I had a lot more data that I could work with than I was able to present in that particular work. And uh, I wanted to continue working on it while I was a faculty member at Rice. And as it turned out, was able to just complete the data collection about a year ago. Tonight, my topic is to try and look at how Christians use power to shape the world around us. I will be speaking as a sociologist, but hopefully touching on issues that I think are appropriate for your own field of political science. So this uh, large project is called the Platinum Study. Platinum is just an acronym, stands for Public Leaders in America Today. That means folks who occupy senior positions of recognized institutions who are living among us, and it's a US-based project, and the inquiry into their networks, upbringing, and motivations. Those are sort of the three major touchstones of the project. It, I've been working on it for eight years, and uh, I'm pleased to say that the data collection is finally complete, as is the data analysis. Now, writing the book is another thing, but it's, I'm glad to have that uh, project completed. As it turns out, I conducted 550 uh, 
in-depth face-to-face interviews with senior organizational leaders. Uh, it included people I'd interviewed for Faith in the Halls of Power, Presidents uh, Carter and Bush. It included about 100 cabinet secretaries, everybody from Donna Shalala to Condoleezza Rice to Colin Powell. In fact, uh, cabinet secretaries dating back to the um, LBJ administration and including uh, Francis Collins, who is currently director of, the, of NIH. It also included uh, CEOs, about 250 CEOs of large enterprises. 20 of the Fortune 100 CEOs uh, are in the study, so the head of General Electric, the head of AT&T, the head of Walmart, the head of ConocoPhillips, a number of other folks, as well as leaders in the nonprofit sector. I, uh, I started out with this project uh, as, actually as my dissertation at Princeton, and when I got to Rice, I had dinner with um, the, uh, the president of, of Rice, and he said, uh, if you could do anything with your research, what would you do? And I said, well, in the course of working on this project, I learned that uh, the largest scale qualitative interview project that was ever done of senior leaders was conducted in 1970 by four researchers at Columbia University. It was called the American Leadership Study. And if I did a couple more hundred interviews, I think I could actually beat that record. Well, now that I'm a college president, I understand any of those kind of superlatives, like biggest, we like those kinds of terms. <laughs> so he said, well, what would it take for you to, to get on that project? And he helped me secure some seed funding, and then I was able to turn that into some additional grant dollars. And as it turned out, I was able to complete the 550th interview. The last study they had done 545, so my goal was 546. <laughs> I got to 550 with an interview with Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, last summer. So it's been a fun project and a, a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot more. It's actually produced a lot of material. So uh, I and my research team would spend about 20 hours conducting background research for every one hour interview that I conducted. And we just have lots and lots of data uh, that we worked through. So it's a, a, actually a large quantitative uh, project as well. We probably um, collected data on about 550 different variables, ran a number of different uh, regression models to see if we could find anything interesting, but actually the qualitative data became much more uh, fuller. There was more material to talk about there. So my project has been trying to cull through all that interview transcript data as well as the background material and try and make sense of it. So tonight I'll just give you sort of an overview, a couple of things that I've been thinking about over the last year or so. Some key questions that are important in this particular project that might be relevant for what I'd present tonight. One is, how is it that uh, senior leaders make decisions? And then how in turn do they shape the organizational culture that they lead? What role does values and character, that can include uh, deep Christian commitments, but can also be broader than that, what role do those play in the exercise of the influence that they wield? How do different uh, life influences that occur early on, like family of origin, educational background, early career mentors, how do those shape their lives? How does the life of the individual leader end up shaping the contours of the organization he or she leads? As you'd expect, you can find a lot of the influence of an individual leader in an organization he or she establishes or founds. But it looks different if they come to lead an organization that's been around for 250 years. The more complex the organization, the harder it is to actually see the influence of one particular person. The White House would be a great example of that, right? You go into the West Wing. It's amazing to me that what actually occurs on Inauguration Day is that there's this massive transformation that occurs in a matter of a few hours. You go in that morning. Let's say you went in on the morning of January 20th of 2009. The entire West Wing has these larger-than-life pictures, photographs, of George W. Bush everywhere in all the offices. It's not just the portrait. It's action shots, lots of different things. Come back at 3 o'clock that afternoon. All of those pictures are down, and all pictures of Barack Obama that were actually taken in the last few months of his campaign, but they put them up so he'll feel at home in the White House. That's actually probably the most pervasive influence you can actually see of a single individual on the contours of the White House. White House is actually very unwieldy, difficult to, to see. And one of the things that I found, for example, uh, that we might talk about in the Q&A, is that the ideological commitments, whether it relate to faith or other kind of priorities of a president, are most obvious not in domestic policy, but actually on foreign affairs. Why? because the American media doesn't pay as much attention to foreign affairs, and the US Congress 
gives the presidency more power, more influence. So I'm interested in looking at those kinds of variations. What motivates current activities and future ambitions of senior leaders? So what is it that gets them going in the morning and how do they actually shape their lives? So we can't talk about leadership and influence without also having a sober assessment of notions of power. And I would say that there are a couple of sort of basic frameworks or expectations. One approach is what we might refer to as empirical positivism. This is largely informed by Weber's notion of how power works. And of course, you remember from uh, political theory, Weber's understanding really treats power simply as domination. The ability to get someone to do something despite resistance. In Weber's formulation, power is largely one of antagonism, where you have uh, someone who has power acting on an, uh, an object who does not have power. There's a, a notion of a hierarchy of the relationship and that there are norms of reciprocity where there is some kind of exchange. It's in essence a zero-sum view of power. Related to that is Weber's notion of authority, which of course has different characters, uh, traditional authority, bureaucratic or rational legal authority, uh, uh, as, uh, as well as um, uh, charismatic authority. So he has these different ways in which power gets exercised through notions of institutional authority. And there are also notions of resistance. And this is sort of woven into how Weber understands how power works. So you oftentimes in this framework will understand power to be a battle of will, wills. Oftentimes there will be references to sports metaphors or even to military metaphors. Probably no place did I see this more evident than in notions of compensation. One of the things that I was interested in was how do the CEOs, I'm sitting down with people who make a lot of money, how do they talk about executive compensation? As it turned out, I was conducting some of these interviews in the very context in which the Occupy Wall Street movement was occurring. So it was great material. Get a chance to hear directly from a CEO who made $70 million last year. How do they talk about the fact that they have employees who are making $13,000 a year? And how is it that it understands their, how does that inform their sort of uh, framework of power and its exercise? This is Glenn Tilton. Glenn Tilton uh, is probably the poster child for what a CEO would not want to say about executive compensation. He was the CEO of United Airlines, uh, led it through bankruptcy in the early 2000s. And uh, in the interview with him, I asked him, you know, how is it that you could justify really um, strong or high levels of executive compensation when you are demanding concessions from labor? M many of the CEOs that I interviewed actually have a very sort of nuanced perspective on this particular issue, not Glenn Tilton. He says instead, uh, my view of uh, attracting the right people to a bankrupt company, which is what United was at the time he was attracted, from Texaco was that they should be paid a virtual premium. People who weren't part of, including myself, decisions that put this company into bankruptcy, well, they should be well paid to come and sacrifice the possibility of advancement in another com a company. Therefore, I had no problems with people paying me a market wage. And of course, market wage becomes sort of uh, a euphemism for really great compensation. <laughs> and Obviously, this actually begins to, to affect his relationships that he has with the different labor unions from whom he's trying to uh, elicit significant concessions. It's interesting because 62% of the people that I interviewed said that they favor no cap on executive compensation, which is almost the direct inverse of the general population. About 65% in most national polls of uh, the American public say that they would like there to be some kind of a, a cap on executive compensation. So here's where you see there's a real differential. And in many ways, uh, Tilton just puts into words this uh, sentiment that I have the power and they don't, and so I can sort of set the agenda by which it works. A second approach to understanding how power gets exercised in society, we might simply refer to a social constructionist perspective, uh, informed largely from the work of Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, which was a seminal work in, in my field of sociology, The Social Construction of Reality, published in 1966. And this is a, an approach that probably more recently has been articulated by Foucault, Michel Foucault, French social theorist. 
And Foucault recognizes power as something that actually is not one that is, is held by an individual. Instead, he says, power exercises itself. And he, he sees it in such a framework that power is not something that, say, Corwin exercises over me, but instead it's something that's depersonalized. So in Foucault's framework, power is not something that either of us actually hold. Instead, we're caught up in these matrices of power, these webs of power that are not housed or held by an individual, but instead are sort of charged in the universe. Now, one of the interesting things is that this creates all kinds of possibilities for different sets of power relationships, right? So that uh, Foucault's framework can understand how it is that, say, a housekeeper can exercise power if um, the person that they're working for is looking for the keys uh, that they've lost in their house and the housekeeper finds it. Housekeeper suddenly has power over the person who, who pays their checks every month. So there's this notion that power is not held by individuals, but it's by mutually constituted relationships. And therefore, there are these matrices of power, and that's really what Foucault gives us. Everything is socially constructed, and therefore, it's not something that we hold. Now, the nice thing is that the empirical positivist approach really works well if you're trying to conduct quantitative analyses. Discrete variables where you can identify what the problems are and you can put them into components and then run a series of uh, models. The social constructionist perspective doesn't really work very well for OLS. It doesn't lend itself for that kind of uh, analysis, but it works very well for many of the more qualitative approaches. And so, indeed, you see, I'm sure within political science, we certainly see within sociology, that these two hermeneutics toward power actually reflect methodological orientations as well. But one thing that uh, it's important to keep in mind is that you can certainly see how power can be socially constructed. For example, in the Middle Ages, if we had to say who was it that held power and how did they get it, it looks different than we see today. In the Middle Ages, it was largely through military might, really a warrior's ability to defend himself and to vanquish his enemy. And so those were the folks who were known to have great power. Not too far away from here, 17th century Salem. Who was it that wielded the power? Well, there weren't a whole lot of knights going around jousting, but it was the educated clergy that wielded significant power over the community and over the lives of individuals. But today, it's not necessarily uh, the military generals who have all the power, nor is it the educated elite. Who is it that exercises power today? Well, if I had to choose one sort of element that I think is the coin of the realm through which power gets exercised in our society today, it's persuasion. Fundamentally, I think that is how power ex gets exercised in our, con in, in our context. And so you can see how power can actually shift based upon different um, settings and different contexts, which is why a lot of people say, are, you know, are curious about, are you, is a leader made uh, over time, or are they born into it? Well, part of it is a mixture of both, because what is it that is valued in that particular society in that particular context? The educated clergy did better in 17th century Salem than they do today. The gifted communicator does better today than they did in the 1500s. So you can see how the different kind of skill set actually can reflect the different social context. But there is an alternative approach that about two years ago I became interested in, in my own work. And it was largely through the writings of uh, a fellow sociologist, Christian Smith, who turned me on to the notion of critical realism. Now, critical realism has been around for a long time. Uh, in the UK, Margaret Archer has probably been one of the largest proponents. And it's something that uh, the humanities have appropriated in uh, the American context, not as much as we've seen in the European environment, but it's something that has really not been appropriated in American social science, certainly not in American sociology, until the last uh, five to seven years. The reason why I think that this approach is very promising is because it makes a helpful theoretical distinction between three categories, the real, the actual, and the empirical. In essence, what it says is that too often we conflate the idea that everything that there is to know is what we can measure. But of course, we know that that's not the case. 
that there's lots of things that we cannot measure that actually are real. And things that are real may not always actualize themselves. Sometimes they have to be activated. And so critical realism gives this sort of emergent view of power. It's one that says that the world is charged with power. Here it has resonances with Foucault. So it's, it's out there in one context or another, but it actually has to be enacted or engaged in a particular environment. So there are all kinds of ways in which power can be enacted. It might occur through a legislative process, or it might occur through hiring or firing an employee, or it might occur through um, you know, um, a fight, a physical fight. One of the interesting things is that critical realism endows agency to non-human actors. So it's not just something that uh, you and I participate in, but it actually recognizes that other things like technology can exercise power over our lives. And I find that to be very helpful. A lot of the frameworks that we have in sociology don't pay enough attention to sort of these non-human actors. And so that I've appreciated. It also recognizes that the whole can indeed be larger than the sum of its individual parts. So it's, a, it's an approach that's more open um, to uh, power dynamics that says that there's complex interactions and combinations. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, just as sound waves travel through the air all around us and light waves can be seen all around us and we actualize and benefit from them even if we cannot see them, even if we do not know they are real, so also power is all around us. It has to be enacted and activated, but there's all kinds of ways in which power gets exercised. We do this every day when we walk into a class. There are a whole host of ways in which we exercise power over our students before we say a word. It comes from our bearing, from our appearance, from um, where we stand in the room, the way in which we uh, have expectations, and the social norms that sort of suggest in this moment, I'll be doing the talking and you'll be listening. And then in a few minutes, we'll reverse the interaction. All of those things are ways in which critical realism recognizes that power can be found around us. The thing I like about it is that it says there are all kinds of mechanisms, sort of like gears, that are at work. And in that, there can be some kind of mechanisms that reinforce power and other mechanisms that actually can neutralize that power. So, you can think about um, in uh, a social interaction. So if you're going to go have a conversation with a colleague and uh, you're trying to, to win over the colleague uh, on a particular point, let's say you're trying to hire a new faculty member in your department and you're really in favor of this particular uh, candidate and you're trying to win over your colleague. Well, there are all kinds of ways in which you can deploy your rhetorical skill to reinforce the opinion of the other person, but also there are ways in which you can neutralize it. So also power works in that way. Now one of my concerns is that the empirical positivist approach, the way in which we analyze and we present our results, doesn't take into account nearly strongly enough these neutralizing and the reinforcing mechanisms. We treat them as control variables, when in fact, we also recognize there's all kinds of interactions that we're missing. And because it becomes too complicated to model, we don't actually include them in our analyses, but I don't think that's the way to go. So I think critical realism provides a way out of that approach. And in my own work, I've found that critical realism provides sort of a theoretical touchstone that can be appropriate. Let me just clarify a couple of terms and then I wanna give you some examples from some of the work I've been doing. I define people as elites. And uh, Americans don't like to think of themselves as elites, and so I don't often use that language when I'm talking to my grandmother, for example. But elites are those folks who occupy uh, a leadership position within a major institution of society. And one of the things that I found is that elites reach their positions of prominence primarily through networks. Now we've known this for a long time, right? When you go out for a, a job interview, your dad tells you, remember, it's not so much what you know, but Oh, you know, right. Well, guess what? The empirical research supports that. Uh, that we find that uh, the people who reach the highest positions of power actually get there primarily through their networks. This is Peter Crow. Peter Crow was an assistant professor at the Fletcher School 
of diplomacy at Tufts University. He had the good fortune of being selected as a White House fellow in the late 1960s, and he was actually tapped to go and work directly for uh, Dean Rusk, then Secretary of State. They formed a close friendship and a relationship, and many times, Peter Crow, who was about 29 or 30 at the time, would serve as a counselor to the Secretary of State on a variety of issues. He had a particular portfolio, and through this uh, relationship, the Secretary began to rely upon him a great deal. One day, Peter Crow was invited to apply for the deanship at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Now, you and I know that uh, that's now regarded as sort of the flagship institution for diplomacy, but actually, at the time, in the late 60s, it was second or third tier. It really was not performing at its very best. And so it was interesting that this um, venerable institution would consider a new dean who was coming from faculty ranks directly, assistant professor, not even tenured at the time, from uh, Tufts University. He goes into the interview at Georgetown and had been in the committee deliberations for 10 or 15 minutes when a knock occurred at the door. A woman came in and she said, Dr. Crow, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have a telephone call. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, uh, is it possible for you to, to take a message? I'm, I'm sort of interviewing for a job. And she said, well, normally I would, but actually it's the Secretary of State. <laughs> Peter Crow said, well, I, I looked around the room to see their reactions, and um, I decided it might be for real. So I said, well, I guess I better take it. So he walks out of the room, and as he was walking out of the room, he could sit, I said, I could hear people starting to begin to whisper among themselves. But he said, I didn't look at him. I just walked out of the room. I went into the uh, antechamber, picked up the telephone, and said, uh, Mr. Secretary, and he said, Peter, I got a question for you, and then proceeded to ask Peter a particular question about something occurring in Southeast Asia that he thought that Peter could probably give him answer. And at the end of the conversation, um, Peter said, Mr. Secretary, how did you find me? He said, well, I, I called you at your office at Tufts, and I couldn't get anybody, so I, I called, uh, I got my secretary to call around, and they said that you were down at Georgetown. And he said, well, how did you find me at Georgetown? He said, I just called the president's office and told him I needed you immediately. <laughs> And he said, um, what are you doing down there? Are you giving a talk? He said, well, I'm actually interviewing for the deanship of the School of Foreign Service. He said, well, this will either make you or break you. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> Meanwhile, the committee was deliberating about what was this episode occurring, this staged moment where the candidate comes in and suddenly the Secretary of State wants to talk to him. They thought, what is that about? In the end, they decided they didn't really care. If the guy could get the Secretary of State to call him, he was somebody they ought to hire him. And indeed, they did hire him. <laughs> Peter Crow served as the dean of Georgetown School of Foreign Service for about 25 years. Elites reached their positions of power through networks. A network like the White House Fellowship or a number of other examples can provide that kind of opportunity, access to leading folks. 61% of White House Fellows told me that they were uh, able to advance professionally because of the networks that they were able to establish. You can see that there are a whole variety of different institutions that can provide these kind of networks. Dominant institutions like McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, earning a Rhodes uh, Scholarship or participating in programs at the Aspen Institute or being involved in political campaigns or earning degrees from selective universities. All of these are ways in which elites actually become part of top networks. They're actually positioned to uh, exert greater influence over power mechanisms through their leadership of particular organizations. For me, power is basically a, a, a social structure that I'm interested in that's anchored in human relations. For me, uh, I find Foucault's framework is not helpful enough because I think it actually, we have to understand it in the context of relationships, but I find that it tends to inhere in institutional settings. So I pay a lot of attention to institutions. Leadership, I simply define as the exercise of non-coercive influence. So it's not a Weberian approach to, to domination, but instead it's a way in which people get things done through non-coercive means. And organizations, I found, become both the means by which these elites have power and the vehicle through which they actually exercise it. 
Dr. Collins at NIH, for example, he both garners power by being the director of the National Institutes of Health, and it also becomes the context in which he exercises that power. And that's not a brilliant insight, but in sociology, we don't pay enough attention to the way in which those kind of institutional arrangements facilitate people's ascent and also exercise of real social power. And because I think that leadership is one that involves mutual influence, it's important to sort of see how is it that they work together not just for their own interests, but also for the interest of others. Which leads me to sort of some simple observations I have of three ways that Christians I've found use the power that they hold in order to shape the world around them. Whenever I go and speak to church groups, it's interesting because I, I often will talk about some of the work that I've done on power. And I invariably will have a long line of people who will come up and tell me just how unpowerful they are, how disempowered they are, how, how they are you know, not part of the power networks that are around them. And then I remind them that simply by being a citizen of the United States in 2012, they actually are the elite of the elite. And then if they are college educated, I remind them that actually 99% of the world does not go to college. And so already, you're one of the one percenters. That always gets them worried. <laughs> so how is it that Christians who have been in different positions of authority, how is it that they exercise power? What I'd like to do is sort of focus on the folks who all of us would agree have some form of power. But I also want to just simply raise the issue that there are lessons that I think that we can apply whether or not you're leading an institution or not. That I think that there's applications that we can make just given our own social context. First form of power that I think um, where I have seen Christians are trying to shape the world around them is through their organizations, the organizations that they lead. One of the key things that I study is how is it that a particular leader tries to shape the culture of the organizations? One person who really impressed me is Mike Ullman. Mike was selected to be the chief financial officer of his alma mater, the University of Cincinnati, at age 29, youngest CFO in higher education. He was hand-selected for the job by Warren Bennis, the sort of great pundit of leadership who now teaches at the University of Southern California, and Bennis was the president at the University of Cincinnati. Mike's an interesting guy. His dad was an engineer who had a really smart idea and ended up successfully commercializing it. Mike's father invented the dishwasher. So he's an interesting guy. Mike, though, was not an engineer. Never really had an interest in that. Always was sort of interested in the retail sector. And so after uh, finishing a stint serving as a CFO at the University of Cincinnati, he moved into the retail world, rose up through the ranks, and ended up serving as the CEO of Macy's. Led Macy's in the late 1980s and 1990s during periods of both restructuring and growth. He later was then tapped to be the CEO of Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. LVMH owns all of the luxury goods that you and I know, um, whether it be uh, Louis Vuitton or um, uh, Fancy Crystal or China or luxury goods, uh, expensive purses, all kinds of things. That's LVMH. He was the CEO there. And then, more recently, he was chosen as the CEO of JCPenney. It's interesting because Mike works very, very long hours. Average people I interview work about 68 hours per week. That's the average. On the upper end, it was over 100 hours a week. And practically no one worked less than 45 hours a week. And so one of the things that I was interested in is, why is it that you put in such long hours? Well, in large part, it's because they love what they do. For them, it becomes a way in which they exercise not just sort of um, their leadership, but part of their identity. And Mike was one of them. 85% told me that, that they love what they do, which is um, significantly higher than what you see among the general public. And they, they go on to lead not just one organization, but multiple organizations. Mike, for example, serves as the chairman of the board of Mercy Ships, a wonderful humanitarian organization, uh, travels around the world trying to help areas of crisis. And Mike has said to me uh, many times that he really views the work that he's doing as a chance to um, build up other people. For him, 
The chance to lead an organization is really important because he says, I get the chance to actually shape where the people who work at JCPenney, where they spend most of their waking hours. And he had a sort of soberness about him when he talked about it. He said, leadership is a gift, but it's also a skill. You have to not want it for you, but you want it for them. To the extent that you leave behind something better than you inherited, that, in my opinion, is what it's all about. Mike's an extraordinary uh, individual. He has a uh, degenerative spinal condition that makes it difficult for him to walk. Very hard to be the CEO if you have difficulty walking. Literally within his office, which is a room uh, half the size of this uh, auditorium. And uh, to get from his desk to his conference table, he rides a Segway. Interesting guy, he's on the board of Segway as well. And uh, <laughs> he's a good advertisement for it. But Mike's a very compelling uh, uh, leader because he's done a tremendous job. Uh, he just stepped down as a CEO of uh, JCPenney. He took over the organization when it was on the brink of bankruptcy. He was personally recruited to the position by Vernon Jordan. You remember Vernon Jordan, President Clinton's trusted advisor? Vernon Jordan served on the board of JCPenney for 30 years. And he said, I wanted to make sure to get the right person in this position. Mike did an extraordinary job. Uh, last year, 40% of American families did business with JCPenney. 40%. That's incredible market penetration. They had higher uh, employee engagement scores than Starbucks and higher customer satisfaction scores than Nordstrom's. So organizations becomes one way in which a number of Christians who I interviewed, Mike is a very deep, serious Christian, how they exercise power in the world around us. One of the things that I think is a real lesson for us is that the gospel has to be seen as legitimate in order for it to be persuasive. And so much of what uh, leaders like Mike do is they help legitimize the practice that there can be somebody who is really leading a major enterprise. It's interesting, when I wrote Faith in the Halls of Power, almost every person who I would talk to who read the book said the first thing I did was look in the back to see who you interviewed. They were sort of curious to see the appendix where I provided the list of interviewees. In large part, I think, because there is a sense in which um, there is some legitimization that occurs when you realize that there are uh, significant leaders leading major enterprises who also sort of share your faith commitment. A second way in which I found that power gets exercised by uh, Christians in the world around us is institutional power. And here, I'm taking an approach from uh, sociology by uh, Woody Powell and Paul DiMaggio, which says that institutions are not the same thing as organizations. They're larger than organizations. So you have this notion of uh, the institution of marriage or the institution of higher education that's larger than an individual person, right? So it's something that's, that's uh, bigger than that. DiMaggio and Powell made some interesting observations in the 1980s and 1990s about institutional isomorphism. That is, how is it that institutions begin to resemble one another? How is it that our families begin to resemble the marketplace, such that kids schedule time with their parents like it's an appointment, like they would have a business exercise? Or how is it there is monetary exchanges that occur so that we actually begin to uh, monetize uh, the value of a child in taking out life insurance policies, right? So this is how institutions begin to resemble one another. I was interested to see how is it that some Christians who I interviewed began to exercise power through much larger enterprises than just individual organizations. One person who is very special to me is George Gallup. His father founded the Gallup Poll in the 1930s. And uh, George uh, led the Gallup Poll, was co-chairman of the organization with his brother for a number of years. And um, in many ways, the, the field that you study has been shaped very significantly by the work of George Gallup. And there's one particular thing that George did that actually sort of reshaped the institution of uh, the American political landscape. It's one you may not be aware of. In the 1970s, George, who had been reared an Episcopalian and who at one time thought that he might go uh, into the ministry, had a born-again experience, a renewal experience of his faith where he and his wife, Kingsley, became involved in a small group. And because of that, George became very interested in how faith could shape the lives of different people. 
because he was in that upper echelon of people. One of my favorite stories of George is Rebecca and I were at his house one day and there was a, a needlepoint pillow on the sofa and, and it was of an American Express card. Mm -hmm. And I said, George, what, you know, what is that about? Uh, why do you have your American Express card on a, uh, a pillow? And he said, oh, that was something uh, my wife, you know, Kenny, her, her mom made for me. And I said, well, that's kind of odd. Why would you do it? And he said, well, because in the 1970s, I was on these American Express commercials where I would get up there and say, you may not know my face, but you know my name. And then he would hold out his American Express card. I'm George Gallup, and it would spell out George Gallup, and I carry the American Express card. He ran in uh, big circles. And so George had this uh, authority within particular the press, right? The Gallup poll was oftentimes covered in the press. And as his faith became more important, George began paying more attention to the relevance of religion to American political life and persuaded his dad in 1975 and in the run-up to the 1976 presidential election to run a series of questions on the Gallup poll, which not only measured the number of people who self-identified as evangelical, but also looked at their political habits. This in turn created a flurry of interest with the uh, nomination of Jimmy Carter, so much so that 1976 was referred to by Newsweek as the year of the evangelical. And in light of that, evangelicals became associated with the American political conversation. And I don't think we can trace it to one particular individual. Jimmy Carter had a significant role to play. Ronald Reagan's candidacy had a role to play. In fact, it's interesting. Jimmy Carter made an off-the-cuff remark on the election, on the campaign trail about being born again. Three weeks later, Gerald Ford announced that he too was born again. And it seems like every presidential candidate since then has been talking about just how born again they are. So we can't say that it was a result of George Gallup. But he did raise the topic through national surveys and became sort of a, a, a trusted resource for the national media. And so religion began to really matter in your field in a way that it had not in the 1950s or 60s. That's how an individual Christian exercises power over an entire institutional domain. So the gospel must not only be seen as uh, legitimate, but it also has to be seen as relevant in order to be persuasive. It has to speak to issues that people are facing. And then third, power can get exercised in very interesting ways, almost in a paradoxical approach. A lot of people ask me if I was impressed with the people that I interviewed, and some of them impressed me a great deal. And then they'll say, well, were you impressed spiritually by people? It's a tough thing to be able to sort of assess somebody's spiritual life in that kind of an interaction. I do feel like I got to know most of the people I interviewed because I spent a lot of time looking into their life and trying to figure them out. The, the good news about the people I interviewed is that a lot had been written about them. The bad news was that a lot had been written about them. So I had lots of things I had to plow through. But in the process, I feel like I got to know folks. The people who impressed me the most were individuals who exercised what I would refer to as a paradoxical approach to power. And one person who did really impress me is Karen Hughes. Now, you may remember, Karen Hughes uh, is the most senior ranking woman who was appointed to a, a top White House position, really in US history. She was named counselor to the president, and her portfolio was the president's portfolio. Unlike a national security advisor or uh, a cabinet secretary, Karen Hughes, many people say when she spoke, uh, or when the president spoke, she was sort of mouthing the words, that, that they really were sort of in uh, deep alliance and had a deep connection to one another. And so uh, it's interesting because her story became a little surprising. You see, uh, the way she tells it, she was very close to George W. Bush when he was governor, and she lived what she said, a great but somewhat normal life when she worked in Austin. She said it was an intense work routine, but I could go home and see my son and my husband. We could have dinner together. I could help my son with his homework. I could even pick him up from school every now and again. It was sort of a normal routine. But when she moved to the White House, 
it was an entirely different environment. I don't know uh, if you spent much time sort of talking with folks who end up serving in very senior positions. I interviewed about six uh, White House Chiefs of Staff. Those people are incredibly tough, in large part because they just have a drive and a commitment that exceeds anything you can imagine. Andy Card, for example, he would get to his office in the West Wing at 5.15 every morning, and he stayed at his office until an hour after the president retired for the evening, which could be as early as 7.30 at night or as late as 10.30 at night, which meant that some nights he did not leave the White House until, uh, until 11.30 at night. He would then go home and sleep for about four hours and then get up and repeat that over and over again. He did that six days a week, and on Sundays he slept in and uh, got to the um, West Wing about 12 noon after he went to church. His wife is a minister, Methodist uh, minister. But uh, he kept that routine up for five and a half years. Incredible routine. And I found, while his was sort of an unbelievably long work day, most people who served in senior White House positions worked incredibly long hours, as did Karen Hughes. And after she'd been on the job for about 18 months, she said, I began to realize I was growing apart from my son and my husband both of whom were miserable. So they were sort of tolerating this miserable existence in Washington to give me a chance to do something extraordinary. And she said, it was exhilarating. I felt like I was really making a difference. I was part of the president's inner circle, and I could uh, help shape sort of his agenda. And after 9-11, all of us felt a very deep sense of loyalty, and she said, I felt it incredibly. Which is why it shocked the political world when she announced one afternoon that she was giving it up. I don't know if you recall, but after about 18 months on the job, she announced that she was moving back to Austin. And when people asked, assuming that she had either been fired from the job or had a falling out with Karl Rove or with Dick Cheney, she said, I'm going home to be with my family. It's interesting because there is a skepticism within your discipline of political science. It goes back a long ways. Uh, there was an Austrian diplomat uh, Wenzel von Metternich, and one time he famously uh, made the observation, uh, one of his uh, assistants came in to announce that the, the French ambassador had recently died. And he turned to his assistant and said, I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> A skepticism. So everybody assumed that Karen Hughes, there was some ulterior motive of what was going on. I gotta tell you, I studied it, I talked to a lot of people who were in the West Wing with her in those early days of the Bush administration, people who knew her after that time. I talked with people in Austin. I think she genuinely left because she was concerned that she wasn't being a good mother. And she felt a deep sense of commitment to trying to take care of her son. As it turned out, uh, she did uh, go back to Washington for about two years after her son went to college. And um, I, I think that She's an interesting story because in large part, she represents a segment of the people I interviewed who had a really compelling story. People who bore witness to their faith and their deep commitments, not by what they did, but by what they gave up. And I did find some interesting, compelling examples of CEOs, for example, who decided to give up uh, end of year bonuses because they thought that uh, the money could be served in better ways or individuals who decided they would limit their compensation, trying to go sort of countercultural. Christians, I found, exercise the most compelling form of witness when they decide to give things up. And there's a real challenge of politics in Christian witness because there's a real hermeneutic of suspicion. And so even the most earnest, uh, heartfelt decisions that people make are presumed to have ulterior motives. So good people sometimes make decisions that you assume is, you know, there's something beneath the surface when in fact there isn't. And I found that that's one of the hardest parts. One of the things that the leaders who I interviewed who said that is really difficult for them is that they can very rarely share all of the information they know when they're making a decision. And I will say I have experienced just a very small element of that in my year serving as a college president. I thought that, you know, uh, I would have this sort of vision of being the transparent leader, 
and I would just sort of share with my colleagues as much as I possibly could, and I've tried to do that, but actually for both the health of the institution and to protect the people who are here, because there's always people involved. You cannot share all that you know. And so sometimes you have to make a decision that people assume you're making for one reason when in fact you can't tell them the real reason you're making it. I think that that's one of the real challenges, especially that you face in the political landscape. The gospel has to not be just legitimate and relevant, but it also has to be attractive. And sometimes that most attractive form of witness comes from folks who are willing to give something up. Three ways that I found Christians who exercise power around the, uh, in, on the world around us in ways in which they've tried to sort of rely upon um, their relationship with God in order to get things done through organizations, through institutions, or sometimes through even paradoxical actions. So thank you. We wanted to share time uh, to see if you had uh, particular questions that you wanted to ask, maybe about some material that I covered in the presentation or um, other topics I didn't cover. I've got lots of good juicy material. We want to make sure that we're recording it so uh, folks will be moving around. If you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, we'll recognize you and they'll bring the microphone to you, please. If you wouldn't mind, would you uh, stand up when you ask your question and tell us who you are and where you're from? Uh, Peter Fever, Duke University. If you were starting this project now, having served for a year in, in a position that would have qualified you to be a subject of your study. What's the question that you'd ask, that you'd add to the instrument that you didn't ask the first time around? That's a great question, Peter. Um, well, one of the things that I've learned that I did not expect is that when you lead an institution, sometimes the hardest work you put in on a project or on an issue is work that nobody can know about. Because you're either trying to get something done before it can be public, or you're trying to prevent something bad from happening. And so you're paddling furiously under the water all the while you're trying to appear tranquil on the surface. And uh, I've experienced this a couple of times. Uh, some of the most intense times where I've had to put in really long hours and get things done have involved episodes that probably nobody here really knows about or not many people know about because it's not appropriate for them to sort of be aware. So I would like to ask uh, the people I interviewed uh, an example of where that's happened in their own life. What was the issue? that they spent more time trying to keep out from the public eye, or something that they worked really hard to try and broker that in the end they weren't able to announce. That's one of the hardest things. You work all these hours on something, and you get it really, really close, and then in the end it falls apart. And so you think, gosh, I've just spent 60 hours working on this, and I have nothing to show for it. Uh, so I probably would ask something along those lines. I have to think about that. That's a, that's a great question. Thank you for your talk this evening. Daryl Charles, Bryan Institute for Critical Thought and Practice. How would you rate the legitimacy, uh, attractiveness, and appeal of Christian attempts at higher education? Huh. Uh, the legitimacy uh, of Christian attempts in higher education, um, I would say that we are um, doing a lot that is a very positive development. Um, I, it's interesting. I, I spent some time with Mark Knoll while I was working on my last book um, and asked Mark to sort of comment on um, his earlier work, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. And I said, you know, I'm just not finding the data to support the, the scandal as you outlined in the book in 1994. And uh, this was about 10 years later. And he said, well, it's because the times have changed. There's more funding. There's more interest. There's more focus. And there's more seriousness occurring in the world of ideas. Christians are doing better work. They're getting recognized for that work. And their institutions are rising in national reputation. 
So I'd say that uh, there is an element of legitimacy that um, didn't exist before. Uh, in my role, uh, in the last month, I had a conversation with uh, a senior faculty member at Harvard who's interested in launching an initiative, and they would like Gordon to be a partner. And they'd like Gordon to be a partner because they think that uh, it resonates with our own sort of institutional ethos, which it definitely does. And they think that they might could learn some things from the experience. I'd be surprised if Harvard would have called us 25 years ago. We just really weren't on their radar map. So I'd say that that has occurred. At the same time, I think probably the most pervasive problem that affects Christian witness in American public life today is what I would refer to as the intellectual and moral rot uh, in the lives of people who espouse uh, Christian commitments in the public square. So we have some real challenges uh, that uh, some people who are our, our loudest um, cheerleaders are also some of the people who uh, don't exemplify the virtues that we would that we would all hope we would live up to. Yeah. Uh, Corwin. Yeah, Corwin Smith, uh, Calvin College. Um, Michael, uh, we all teach at educational institutions, and so uh, you know your emphasis on it's not what you know but who you know uh, might sort of downplay education. So I guess one of my questions would be, um, would you say that maybe it's what you know helps you to remain in power hmm. as opposed to uh, uh, gain power? Hmm. And so that's one question. But then I just need a more factual correction perhaps on my own research. Hmm. I thought that Gallup's first efforts to measure evangelicals was in the, his survey that he did and published in Christianity Today in 1979. No, oh, sorry. Okay, no, that's, so that's what I need to know. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the study they did with CT was their most exhaustive work they had done on evangelicals, but they began asking questions in 1975. And then um, I, don't, I don't know how much they, they published. Um, when I, I, I co-authored a book with uh, George called Surveying the Religious Landscape, and when I was sort of in the data archives, uh, what I found is that they had done an enormous amount of sort of cross-tabular analyses in that 1975 and early 1976 study that was looking at sort of um, points of affiliation among those folks who self-identified as evangelical. The, the, and it's interesting, Corwin, because the 79 study really got Gallup um, in a conundrum because uh, they began to realize that there were multiple ways to measure evangelicals. And uh, the, the way that they had, been, they had asked the question in 1975 was different than the way they asked it in 1979. And uh, it ended up being that the way they asked it in 1975 became the trend question that they followed all along, so that Christianity Today study looks like an anomaly. And George says, you know, we just didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that, it started a little bit before that. Uh, th th your first question was about uh, oh, what you know. Yeah. Robert Clickard uh, wrote this book called Selection at the Right Tail. Uh, in which he, he talks about uh, the ways in which folks, uh, when you have a normal distribution curve, who are those folks that are sort of at the right tail of that curve and how do they get selected? And what we find is that uh, what you know is presumed to sort of be a basic requisite for being able to gain access, but that isn't actually how you get opportunities. And Mark Granovetter's book, uh, Getting a Job, or um, his uh, article that appeared in Miracle Journal of Sociology, really looked at the the effect of uh, loose ties and that that becomes very significant. So what I found in my research was that it was presumed that you would sort of have domain specific knowledge, but to really move up within an organization or institution, it did fundamentally become about relationships. And so what that underscores to me as a college president of a Christian liberal arts college is that relationships are really at the heart of what we are doing. It's why we care so much. It's why we're willing to dedicate uh, resources to what is arguably the most expensive form of higher education, but it actually happens to be the most effective. Oh, over here. Um, Hold on just a sec, we'll bring the microphone. Um, AJ Nolte, I'm a grad student at uh, Catholic University. Uh, you've talked a good deal about um, some of the ways that you think Christians have been the most effective, sorry, uh, Christians have been the most effective at um, 
um, shape, using power to shape the world ar around them. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the opposite of that. Uh, were there any common characteristics among uh, people who you feel either were or perceived themselves to be ineffective at using power to shape the world around them? Mm. Yes, it's a great question, AJ. In fact, I started off on the interview guide. I use a semi-structured interview guide. And one of the early questions that I would ask is, how do you exercise power today? Terrible question. Because everybody would say, oh, I don't have any power. What are you talking about? I'm so constrained. I can't do anything. I interviewed Michael Duke, the CEO of Walmart, and he spends 20 minutes telling me just how little power he has. I then say to him, you know, you employ more people than live in some countries. Uh, it seems to me that you do actually exercise power. And so um, a number of the people I interview uh, would not claim to have power, but then I would often, I, would, I, I rephrased it. And I got to where I would ask them, you know, when you need to get something done outside of your organization, how do you do it? And that revealed a lot of interesting sort of ways in which power gets exercised beyond those particular environments. Tonight, I have taken the, the approach of sort of looking at the glass half full approach. I'm, I'm sort of an optimistic uh, scholar. But there are some sort of darker sides that I would say that I encountered of people who did not embody the virtues uh, of their faith and who did not exercise power in an appropriate way. Lots of people who uh, had leadership failures and moral failures. One of the interesting things that I found is that uh, because the pressure of the job is so great, most of the time the thing that gets people into trouble is their strengths carried a bit too far. So if you uh, look at a political leader, it's interesting because it's actually pretty rare to find a political leader who gets in trouble because of embezzling money. Very rarely do you have political figures who get in trouble over monetary issues. You know what normally gets them in trouble? Sex. Why? Because they're relationally gifted. And this is how they sort of get off track. They're able to form relationships and connections with people. And they're in these sort of uh, charismatic uh, opportunities and uh, interactions. And they suddenly begin to get off track with their relationships. So most of the moral failings that I encountered were people who were taking their strengths and they carried them just a bit too far and they didn't have systems of accountability in their life. And there's a, a long stream of people that I interviewed who sort of fall into that particular category. And at the same time, um, the, the problem that tended to get business leaders in trouble more times than not had, did not do with sex, but it actually related to money or to power. And so I, I do think that there's something about how we are wired that can actually require us to have different forms of accountability in our life. Yes, ma'am. Jennifer Walsh, Azusa Pacific University. Yeah. Um, last year, sometime, maybe it was a few months ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education um, published a study, initial study, that showed that um, students who are admitted into elite grad programs come from just a small number of undergraduate institutions, your uh, IVs as well as your top schools like Williams. Um, what are the implications for students in Christian higher ed? And did you find that to be true in your interviews with your leaders? Hmm, that's a great question. I actually have found that uh, the vast majority of the people that I interviewed did not go to what we might refer to as a name brand undergraduate school. The vast majority did not. Now most of them did go to a name brand school for graduate school. So if they went to law school, they tended to go to Stanford or Harvard or Chicago or Yale. If they went to business school, they went to those top tier places. But uh, for undergraduate, most of them didn't go to those top, uh, to, to the name brand schools. The single most important thing that sort of shaped their undergraduate experience is not where they went, but who they worked with. Mentors played a tremendous role in sort of shaping the horizons. And uh, most of them, over half of the people I interviewed, talked about the formative role of mentors. And almost always it occurred through a, a relationship they had with a professor. But that became really important to them. On the, uh, the graduate admissions uh, front, one of the interesting things that, that I learned uh, while I was a grad student at Princeton was that uh, oftentimes Christian colleges can become uh, a way in which a, an applicant is seen as a diversity recruit because there are fewer applicants from those kinds of schools. Now, granted, there are all kinds of bias that can exist because in a competitive pool where you've got 300 applicants for 10 spots, all it takes is one member of the committee to say, you know, I wonder if Michael is really ready to come to Princeton 
But I'm just wondering, would he fit in with our particular sort of culture? That's all it takes, because it's very competitive. And then my chances are completely out. At the same time, uh, those top performing students who have done independent work, that's really important that they can show evidence of independent work and have a strong mentoring relationship with a faculty member who knows what it takes to write the right kind of recommendation to get into those programs, that actually becomes a real asset for them uh, when they're actually trying to get in. Yes, sir. Kevin Cooney, Northwest University. Um, having done a lot of similar type of research, my question to you is kind of a softball one, but uh, you've done 550 elite interviews. What was the one interview that escaped you that you would still like to do and why? Mm, that's pretty easy, Bill Clinton. I really wanted to interview President Clinton and uh, twice I thought that I was gonna get the interview. And uh, in the end I did not. And uh, I just, I, I think President Clinton is a, is a very complex person. And I'd love to be, uh, you know, I, there's no chance that I'm gonna ask a question that's gonna trip him up. I worked so hard for my interview with Condoleezza Rice and I tried all these different angles. I mean, I spent, I spent weeks preparing for that interview, trying to get ready for her. And I thought, you know, I would go in this angle. There was not a single question I could throw at her that she had not sort of totally anticipated. She was as smooth as silk, totally <laughs> unflustered. And so I imagine President Clinton would be exactly the same way. But I, I would have loved to have gotten a chance to do the interview. I have, however, called it quits. My days of data collection are over. And uh, I'm, I, I am simply now trying to sort of make sense of what I collected. Yeah. I see. John. John Skillen from Gordon College here. Michael, uh, I suppose lurking behind my question is one I'm sure you feel it a thousand times, and that is how one squares a positive use of the term power hmm. with, you know, with our Lord and his, <laughs> his uh, actions and words about simply serving, about washing feet and that like. So I'm not gonna ask that question. I'll put it in the form uh, of just changing how to say, how do Christians use unpower to shape the world around us. Maybe I'm thinking of, you know, from Gandhi to Rosa Parks, I'm, mm. and, but I'm asking uh, from among the people you interviewed, uh, did any of them speak of actually actions of negating or withholding power mm. as a means of shaping the world? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, uh, John. And I, I was trying to sort of get that with my last point of sort of this paradoxical notion in which power gets exercised, that the most uh, what I found to be the most compelling forms of Christian witness were moments when people gave up privileges or perks that the rest of us would assume they're entitled to. So I, I did encounter that. I found it among government leaders, I found it among nonprofit leaders, found it among business leaders. And that, that would be sort of way in which I think that sort of countercultural, Tim Keller calls it the desire for a counterculture for the common good. And I like that notion that there are actions that they do that don't make sense. And uh, I think that giving up is probably the easiest way as I as a sociologist could sort of study it or encounter it. I, uh, it's interesting because uh, Rosa Parks or uh, Gandhi, acts of civil disobedience, without structures of power to grant legitimacy to those extraordinary acts of heroism, we don't know about them. So media becomes an important mechanism for helping words to get out, and also endorsements, right? So having someone who actually has legitimate authority to be able to cite Rosa Parks as an exemplar of what it means to, to do things the right way becomes a way in which power gets exercised. So no matter how I tried to sort of escape it, I found that actually power structures really are the, the vehicle through which influence flows today. Uh, when I think, I spent, I don't know, maybe uh, two years thinking sort of spiritually as I was working on the formation of this particular project, because I came into it, I sort of um, stumbled upon, and it's not something I thought when I was 12, well, I'm going to go study powerful people. It really sort of emerged. I taught a class at, uh, or I TA'd a class at Princeton that was on power, and while I was prepping the class, the, the professor who was teaching it, uh, she was a, a wonderful woman, a secular Jew, and I asked her, we were reading all these books about the educational backgrounds of these folks and their, their money networks, but we didn't talk about their religious lives. And she said to me, well, that's, you know, 
very straightforward, Michael. It's because none of them are religious. And I said to her, well, I don't believe that. And she said, well, if you could prove that, that would be a book worth reading. So <laughs> that was really sort of the impetus of it. But I would say that there was a, you know, a, a season of about 12 months when I began to think, am I just reinforcing the very structures of secular society that Jesus called into account? And uh, as it turned out, uh, I was able to have a, a series of uh, good conversations with a friend of mine named Andy Crouch, who was at the time sort of also thinking about power. And Andy made a helpful observation for me that I then sort of began to really reflect on. It's interesting because all of the disciples were basically goading Jesus to rebuke the worldly power structures around them. It really was. And clearly we can see in Jesus' ministry, he's not impressed with that secular power, but yet he never once rebuked it. It wasn't like he said, these are bad folks or they're doing wrong things. And indeed, you know, I think if you, if you look at how um, the gospel has been transmitted to our lives today, it has actually been mechanisms of power that have allowed it to flourish. Now, you can say that Christianity is harmed by the role of Constantine, but you cannot deny the fact that it has reached a much wider network of people because of Constantine. So I think one of the great things that we have to do if we're going to have a gospel-centered approach to power is to not be entranced by it, while at the same time recognizing that there can be some godly good that I think occurs in that environment. I, uh, tonight, I focus more on sort of the, the good side. I can give you a, an equally compelling talk on the dark side, because there's lots around it, but nobody likes that on a Friday night. So. <laughs> Yes, sir. Hi, Brent Nelson, uh, Furman University. Uh, I'm really glad you just said that because um, my question has something to do with that. A couple weeks ago, I finished um, Charles Murray's Coming Apart. Mm. And I was deeply convicted, uh, partly because I've spent most of my life trying to climb the power structure ladder so that I can have the legitimacy to speak um, at the level, because I read Mark Knoll's book uh, when I was in graduate school, so, um, and, and I was trying to reverse the scandal of the evangelical mind. But I was deeply convicted because I, uh, because he underlines that the bottom 20% of Americans are disintegrating. Uh, they no longer go to church, their families have disintegrated, their work ethic has disappeared, and I kept asking, well, where is the church. Maybe the evangelical church has spent so much time trying to reach the suburbs that we, we left the rural areas and, as well as the urban areas. And so it's, it's kind of related to that previous question, but I just wonder what you would have to say now that we've achieved the level being in some of those halls of power. Mm. Um, now what do we do about the disintegration of the bottom 20%? Mm. Well, one of the key things that I noticed is that um, Probably uh, there's been a real shift in our lifetime of local congregational life. And I think that this has played a significant role in that disintegration. There's always been a division. The Episcopalians were always richer than the Baptists, and the Presbyterians looked down on the Methodists. There always have been uh, class divisions that occur in church life. And yet, the church, for all of the racial divisions that the church has reproduced in its context, the economic divisions have actually, over the course of American history, typically been broken down through the life of the local church, where you have the bank president and the bank teller worshiping in the same congregation. And it becomes one of the only social institutions where these two folks know each other not as fellow employees, but actually as brother and sister. That is not the context of American Christianity today. It was our legacy for 250 years. But uh, as we have become more divided uh, geographically through urban sprawl and the proliferation of neighborhood churches and the, the doing away with uh, the sense of sort of uh, city center congregational life where you did have those folks brought together, it has created this sort of what I would call a gated community of the soul where the rich tend to congregate with one another and the poor tend to congregate with one another. Those divisions have existed but they are much more exacerbated today. So a very small sort of antidote that I try to uh, encourage our students at Gordon is actual church involvement. 
to say that uh, it's really important to be engaged in the life of the local church. Because one of the things that I found is that of these 550 people that I interviewed, a majority of them said that they got more spiritual nourishment outside of local churches than inside local churches. That they were involved with prayer groups or Bible studies or fellowships or all kinds of things. They listened to Tim Keller's sermons on audio files. And that became their worship instead of actually going to the church down the street. So one of the things I try and do is just encourage our stu students to be actively involved in local church life because I think that that's an opportunity to sort of help that divide. So, well, I, I know our time is up. Uh, can Paul ask his question? And we'll let that be the last question, Paul. I want to let I was a, asked once, I, I was yes. giving a presentation somewhere and, be, and they had already committed to me and, they, and the, uh, the priest said, well, uh, Paul, I want you to tell me what you think the gospel is in three minutes or less. And I'd like to ask you to do the same in two minutes or less. <laughs> And my concern is a little bit a segue from John Skillen and the gentleman over here who's emulating Mark Knoll's notion. Um, I mean, we know that the gospel is socially constructed in different cultures. And so that, I mean, one of the more dramatic examples is South America. We have Roman Catholic against Roman Catholic. You have a, a liberation social construction of the gospel. Hmm. And then you have the papist notion of the gospel. And then you have a southern evangelical notion of the gospel. And then you have et cetera. And, I mean, you're talking about, you, you, you segue from, you know, getting to power, networking and so forth. And I wasn't sure I caught how that happens if you're following a particular version of the gospel. And then when you get to power, what that exercise looks like depending on what you understand the gospel to be. So in two minutes or less, what is your socially constructed gospel? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the gospel. So, I mean, Paul, <laughs> if they're gonna ask me, you can ask me now, now how does that get itself worked out? No, no, it's my turn. So if, uh, so, so if, it's, uh, if you're asking how does that get worked out, I'm, I'm not trying to make an argument about how the gospel relates to uh, the networks of power in which they exist. I think the gospel both uh, provides an impetus for the people I interviewed for um, opportunity, for ambition, for um, exercising influence over the organizations, institutions, or relationships they're involved in. It also calls them to account. And I think that you, you cannot understand the gospel without understanding that um, countercultural element that I was mentioning, that there, is, uh, there are uh, <coughs> expectations of accountability that I think the gospel inf re requires of committed Christ followers. And uh, not enough of us and of them have those systems of accountability in their life. How does it get sort of uh, socially appropriated? Um, as, I mean, that's not a two minute uh, response. I think that uh, one of the, the key things that I found uh, which was what I was trying to make in that sort of last point, is that the most compelling form of gospel witness, I think, were folks who were, um, in a very small way, exercising an ethic of sacrifice. And I think that that does reflect uh, on the atone, atoning work of Christ. And if you had to say to me, what is at the heart of the gospel, it is a belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. To me, that's the non-negotiable of the gospel. And out of that, it emanates... Uh, an ethic by which we understand our lives and the social world around us.